skinned alive. It caused her to lose 100% of the skin. When everyday medicine goes horribly wrong. It's gonna be a really slow, painful death. Nature's cruel trick. It's known as a lobster club. The family curse of this debilitating condition. A microsurgical miracle turns toes into fingers. We're basically harvesting a toe. The invisible torture of rubber joint syndrome. Is a syndrome that can kill individuals without them even knowing that they have it. Can a man have a baby? The wonder boy who has the doctors talking about the unthinkable. Theoretically, there's no reason why pregnancy can't develop in the abdominal cavity of a man. The most incredible species on the planet is human. resemblance to lobster claws is unmistakable. On each hand, pincers for fingers. This is not the result of an injury or amputation. Lobster claw syndrome is an accident of nature. Kathy has the most severe manifestation of ectrodactyly. It has given her claw hands as well as malformed feet. It affects my hands, which causes me two fingers on each hand. Um, and it caused my legs to kind of like have one knee and one toe on each leg. And she's not alone. It's plagued her family for six generations. Her father, Grady, had it. His great-grandfather before him. The conditions run in a family for approximately 155 years. It's not every member. And there's no way of telling if the condition is going to be pop up or not. You know, there's just no way of telling. Oh, he's not going to eat. <laughs> it's a genetic condition that doesn't skip generations. There's always a 50% chance of it being passed on. In the most severe manifestation, it's also known as a lobster claw deformity, so that instead of having five digits on your hand, you would have two that are divided in this way. Ectrodactyly is the product of an as yet unknown combination of defective genes. Normal sequence is that you make all five, but if there's an abnormality in processing or in signaling to make those five, you can make something less than five, anything from one to, to five. Once, sufferers of this condition were ostracized. Kathy's great-grandfather even took work as the lobster boy in a sideshow. But for her, it's no disability. This doesn't prevent me to doing anything. I do whatever I feel like doing, when I feel like doing it. I can style my hair, I can do needle pointing, I can paint, I can vacuum the floors, I can cook. You know, everything that anybody else can do with their hands, I can do with mine. It remains a medical mystery, but geneticists are hopefully closing in on the secret of lobster claw syndrome. We don't know what the genes are yet, and they're small families in very rare conditions, so it'll take us some time to find them out, but we will. It was just a simple antibiotic. She had a little bit of an infection. She went to her doctor, her doctor gave her a little pill, and two days later, she's in a hospital dying. But her body was thrown into turmoil. When I reached down to pick her up, I could feel blisters start to pop. She was in miserable pain. The medicine intended to make her feel better had skinned her alive. You know, I told her family that she had maybe a 10% chance of surviving, and that was being optimistic. November 2003 and 29-year-old Sarah Yergin was in love. Life was bliss. Until a simple sinus infection came along.
her doctor prescribed a common antibiotic. I went to bed with aches and pains and a fever. Got up the next morning and had some slight discoloration in my face. And it seemed a little swollen. Alarmed at her symptoms, Sarah consulted the antibiotic product information. Hi, I'm having um, some of the symptoms that are listed on my patient information sheet. She had blisters all over her lips and inside of her mouth and her eyes were red and starting to blister. Was she? She's not getting any better. I think we need to take her to the emergency room. So her boyfriend Dave had to pick her up and put her in the car because she couldn't even barely walk. When I reached down to pick her up, I could feel blisters start to pop and, and gush all over. By now, Sarah was in agony. I really felt like she was just going to die, but it was going to be a really slow, painful death. She was in miserable pain. I kept giving her shots of pain medication. wasn't helping. Sarah was in a critical condition. She was, literally, shedding her skin. Quick intervention could mean life or death. The emergency room physicians recognized right away what her condition was. Sarah was rushed to the University of California San Diego Burns Unit. And within three hours, we had her in our hospital. She was diagnosed with toxic epidermal necrolysis, a devastating one chance in a million reaction to her antibiotic. Sarah's body had formed an antibody against the drug. She'd lost a vital protein that keeps the body's outer skin attached. It caused her to lose 100% of the skin in her body. It, it actually causes sloughing of all the mucosal layers. Sarah also began to lose skin inside her body. She lost the corneas of her eyes and began shedding the linings of her internal organs. During the night, Burns said her staff struggled to keep Sarah alive. If you come in with 100% slough, you have 100% mortality, right? At three in the morning, they said I should just go home because they wouldn't let me be in there. They had things they needed to do. And I said, I promised to tell her goodbye. Well, we knew we had our work cut out for us, but given her age and given the, the quickness with which she was brought to us, we were optimistic that we'd be, that if anybody could be saved, it would be her. By morning, Sarah's condition had deteriorated. Her face had peeled. She was just bloody and oozy everywhere, like an open sore her entire body was. Dr. Lindbergh held out little hope. You know, I told her family that she had maybe a 10% chance of surviving and leaving the hospital. Um, and that was being optimistic. He said, just, you know, stick with her, but don't be shocked when she dies because that's most likely what will happen. Christmas was approaching and everyone was praying for a miracle. From Medical Incredibles, Tales of the Bizarre, the stomach turning story of a girl who wouldn't stop chewing her hair. A young lady who uh, had long hair and like many young women, she sucked the end of her hair as a kind of nervous habit. Little did she know that inside her stomach, a hairball was growing, strand by strand. And she ended up with one of the commoner uh, complications of sucking your hair, which is a hairball in her stomach. Now, people's cats get that all the time because they suck their hair. But uh, this hairball that she had occupied the entire lumen or inside of her stomach so that she couldn't eat anymore. This hairball was six years in the making. It's now on display at Washington, D.C.'s National Museum of Health and Medicine. 
The girl was diagnosed with an emotional disorder called trichophagia. Fortunately, she survived the operation to remove the mammoth stomach-shaped ball of hair. Sarah Yergens took a basic antibiotic, which threw her body into mayhem, a reaction so severe that all of her skin fell off. Now she was in a hospital with a medical team fighting for her life. Without skin, body fluids literally leak out. People lose literally gallons of fluid every day if they don't have their skin. Without skin, our bodies dramatically lose heat. And without skin, we're defenseless against infection. I mean, we were all colonized with bacteria that live there. And the only reason they don't enter our bloodstream is because of the skin. To give her any chance of survival, an artificial substitute skin was stapled to Sarah's exposed body. It's a tissue-thin sheet of silicone embedded with collagen and stem cells from neonatal foreskins. But there was no guarantee the skin cells would reproduce. If they didn't take, there was no plan B. The skin cells were Sarah's last hope. I would sit there with her and she would um, cry for help and she would cry and she would scream and she'd claw her chest open and bleed. You could see uh, blood all over her mouth and just uh, all over her teeth and it was very disturbing. I mean, it was just horrid to see her every day and I, and I prayed for her to come back whole. But Sarah was now in real danger of losing her eyesight. Toxic epidermal necrolysis usually causes permanent eye damage. Plastic caps were inserted to save her corneas. Sarah was rushed to hospital in November. It was now nearly Christmas, and she was still clinging to life in the Burns unit. Christmas Day came and went, and it was just another day waiting to get closer to the hopes that she would survive. What Catherine could not know was that a little Christmas miracle was unfolding beneath the gauze. Sarah's skin had begun repopulating her entire body, cell by cell. She was going to pull through. When I did wake up, um, the only reason I know it was New Year's Day was because the nurse had turned on the Rose Parade. And I knew the Rose Parade happened on New Year's Day. Every day when I saw her and I realized that she was going to recover, I, I was just smiling and grinning from ear to ear because I knew we had saved her. We had pulled somebody back. While Sarah survived, doctors feared that she would be permanently disfigured. But instead of being damaged, her skin was reborn. It's, I mean, it's basically like a, a baby skin where it's just very sensitive and delicate. Her new skin was as thin as rice paper, but it was healthy. For a year, Sarah's fragile skin must be shielded from the sun. And there's a sunny side to owning baby skin later in life. My dermatologist said it would be great because, you know, in 10 years time, I would be, you know, I wouldn't be suffering from all the wrinkles that most people when they're 40 do. So that's one good thing. <laughs> For the medical team at the UCSD Burns unit, Every visit of Sarah's brings back memories of a miracle. Oh, it's so good to see you. I'm so happy you're here. You look great. You look wonderful. So good. I'm so good. I'll remember her. I'm one of my favorite patients. She's back whole 100%, which is what I prayed for the entire time, was for her to be whole. The fact that she survived to me is a complete miracle. Dr. Lindbergh told me that um, for somebody that had TENS, toxic epidermal necrolysis syndrome, that I'm 
that he knows of, I'm the only person that's ever survived 100% sloughing. One little pill nearly snatched Sarah's life away from her. It took a dedicated army of medical helpers to bring her back. It's hard to think about. It's hard to um, really wrap my head around that concept. I'm glad to be here. Can humans sprout horns? Impossible? Think again. Philadelphia's Mutter Museum holds wax replicas of a horn-like lump that grew from a real woman's head. And here's a real horn that sprouted from a forearm. Called cutaneous horns, the bizarre growths develop from precancerous cells that harden because of the presence of keratin, the same substance we find in our fingernails. Incredibly, human horns are more common than you'd think. It can take years for a contortionist to learn how to bend his body this far out of shape. The masters of this art dislocate their joints at will. But some people are born with rubbery joints that pull out without warning. It's a condition where the simple act of standing is like torture, and it's a condition that can kill without you even knowing you have it. I was in constant pain every minute of every day. Just reaching to get a glass can result in a dislocation. He sat down looking at me, he's like, I feel like an old man. I can't keep my joints together anymore. Knuckles, you get whacked a lot. Twelve-year-old Cameron Ostringa has dislocated his finger. Your thumbs back where it belongs. His stepfather, Alberto, is putting it back in place. Yeah, you've got some they both have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome affects the body's collagen, the glue that keeps joints in place. 80% of the human body is collagen. At any given moment, any of Alberto's joints could pop out. If I wake up and something's not in place, I put it in place. There's very few joints in my body that I cannot relocate myself. Alberto's shoulder has pulled from its joint 12 times. His hips have dislocated five times. His knee, eight times. And that's just on an average day. It even happens in his sleep. So if I were to just, you know, literally jump out of bed and land on my feet, I'd fall down. <laughs> my ankles wouldn't be where they belong. So the first thing I do is kind of set my ankles, pop them back into place. Doctors thought that Alberto would be in a wheelchair by his mid-twenties. Instead, he's a martial arts champion, using his hypermobility to advantage. The twist is that like all Ehlers-Danlos sufferers, Alberto still gets injured doing something as simple as opening a refrigerator. They may dislocate running for a bus. Somebody who bumps into them can put a shoulder out. Even having sex becomes a problem. Contortionists throughout the ages have employed their elasticized joints to amaze and entertain. It requires strength and, more importantly, control. The performance lasts about 15 minutes. But Ehlers-Danlos sufferers need this level of concentration the whole day. Alberto's wife, Carly, has an even worse form of Ehlers-Danlos. I couldn't stand up without my left hip coming out of socket every time. In addition to affecting her joints, vascular EDS means her internal organs can rupture at any time. I kind of feel like your body is no longer uh, there for you, but almost like an enemy. It betrays you. Characteristics of the vascular type are often not noticed until the individual presents in the emergency room with a bowel rupture or an arterial rupture. Carly met Alberto at a research program into this rare condition. Basically, with all our Stanlos, you feel like you're a Raggedy Ann or a Raggedy Andy. And like with Alberto's case, he does these incredible things. He can break through 10, 12 
14 inches worth of cement or concrete, but yet when he reaches inside the refrigerator and pulls out a gallon of milk to pour in his coffee, he'll dislocate. It's incredible. There is no cure for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. It's a gene defect, but through martial arts, Alberto has trained his body to control its every movement. Strong muscles help keep his joints in place. Part of the things you learn in martial arts is this connection between your brain and your body. Finger braces keep Alberto's digits in place, but the pain never stops. If you woke up in the morning and the first thing I did was jab you with a hypodermic in the thigh, you know, it would hurt. <laughs> but after a month of being jabbed in the thigh every single day, you would barely notice it. As a child, doctors just thought Alberto was clumsy, but it was when he was driving his new sports car that he realized he had something more serious. I was 22 and I had a little five-speed sports car. And every time I shifted into fifth gear, my shoulder would sublex as I would reach into the fifth gear. And it hurt, <laughs> it hurt a lot. And I went to my doctor and I said, you know, there's something weird going on with my shoulder. And they looked at it and said, well, you've got this tremendous range of motion. Uh, and his response was, get rid of the sports car. Ehlers Danlos is hard to diagnose because it is so rare. The symptoms are easily missed. Ehlers Danlos syndrome is rare. In America, let's say there are 50,000 people who have it. So your physician may only see one, possibly two cases in their entire career. And you can't test for it. Thousands of people are walking around with recurring injuries not realizing they have a form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. The thing about Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is that it is different for everybody. The children, Cameron and Brittany, are Carly's from a previous marriage. Each of them had a 50% chance of inheriting EDS from Carly. Carly's hopes of the odds sparing her children were in vain. Brittany developed symptoms three years ago. Because of dancing at a young age, I was aware of my body and what my limitations were. And because of that, I'm, you know, not as bad as I could be. At age nine, Cameron also began to show the signs. Half a year ago, he sat down and looked at me with tears in his eyes and said, Mom, I got to talk to you about something. He sat down looking at me, he's like, I feel like an old man. I can't keep my joints together anymore. You can't fight with a sword if you're afraid of a stick. It's difficult to predict what a person diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome will experience in their life, because the nature of the syndrome is that it's different for every individual. But you're hitting your doze to chest. Alberto now teaches kendo. Martial arts has become a family passion. But the risks are obvious. While we filmed, Cameron's finger was pulled from its joint. Knuckles, you get whacked a lot. Your thumb's back where it belongs. Okay. Just like this. Yeah, you've got some movement. Chill out for a bit. You're okay. Just keep it moving. I try to put up my block, and then I guess I did it wrong where I didn't follow up right, and he whacked him on my fingers. Now I dislocated my thumb, but it's back in now. And it hurt a lot. And then from here, the blade stays straight and you just circle. One of the mysteries of Ehlers-Danlos is where the pain comes from. The joints are not inflamed. There appears to be no degeneration of tissue. There are many things that we don't know the answers to, and we don't know the answer to why there is pain with the hypermobility type. But we're finding those answers. The Freedmans are learning to live with this incurable condition. They travel with a wheelchair, never knowing which member of the family might need it. We actually have two wheelchairs um, because at any moment we could need one. I could be getting out of the car and pop a hip out of socket and be in need of one. To look at us walking down the street normally, we look like these healthy individuals who have really nothing going on physically that keep us back from whatever it is that we want to do. Internally, however, it's a different story. He was supposed to be in a wheelchair by his mid-20s, was for a while, and worked his way out, 
and then became a world champion in martial arts. Go figure. And that makes Alberto Friedman incredible. So once I was competing, and I don't remember the competition, but I threw what's called a round kick, where the foot comes up and out. I, I kicked towards the guy's head, and he got his blocking arm up, caught my leg right above the knee on the thigh, and my knee hyperextended, wrapped around his arm. The foot hit him in the head and bounced off with enough force to relocate the knee, set my leg back down, and the judge stopped the match. He came out and he looked at me and he goes, did your knee just, did that just, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. You know, my knee was back, I was okay. He looked at me and said, are you sure? I said, yeah. He goes, well, I don't know what just happened, but I saw a point and I called for it and I got the point. And at the end of the match, the other guy came up to me and said, my arm was here, right? I said, yeah. Just kind of left it in that mystery phase, but that's probably the only time Mar the EDS has actually helped in a competition. The symptoms of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome are easily missed, yet the worst type of EDS doesn't just threaten lifestyles, it threatens lives. But what we're dealing with here is a syndrome that can kill individuals without them even knowing that they have it. What makes the body grow out of shape? These 19th century photos tell a tragic tale of medical conditions for which there was no known cause or cure. The most famous of all, Joseph Merrick, the Elephant Man. He lived in Victorian England, and the reason for his gross deformities is still being debated today. We don't know why the body is able to regulate us to be the exact size that we are, and we don't know why some people overgrow in some parts of their body. Overgrowth syndrome is not a thing of the past. This unsolved medical mystery still happens. Gordon McGuire had a massive growth removed from his side shortly after birth. He is now 43 years old and his feet will not stop growing. Growing up, the issue of amputating either one foot or both feet came up often. A series of surgeries has paired them back to stumps. They basically took off the last three to five inches. I can now walk without the amount of pain that I had, had to grow accustomed to. We don't know what the cause of the hand deformities are. <laughs> Three-year-old Devion also has overgrowth syndrome. He was also born with a massive growth on his side. His middle finger was enlarged, and the mass on the end of his arm was unrecognizable as a hand. He told me that it was a bloody mass and it'll be a bloody surgery and he may have to lose his arm and he may not survive the surgery. And The biggest problem that we saw that he couldn't even move his arm down next to his side. Devion's hand is still growing, but the growth on his side was successfully removed. Meanwhile, geneticists around the world search for that one clue that will crack the code of overgrowth syndrome. Learning to fix genetic disease, of course, is the holy grail of, of the geneticists. The cause has been identified, the first step towards finding a cure. That medical breakthrough can't come soon enough for a little boy with time on his side. Fingers torn off in a construction accident. There was flesh and meat and a bone sticking out. Then, the unthinkable. We're basically harvesting a toe. Is it medieval madness? Slimy little slug. Or a miracle of microsurgery? A crisp November morning on the bustling San Francisco Bay Bridge for construction worker Scott Thornton. I was having a real good day that day. I had a couple of apprentices with me and just doing uh, some little uh, beautification work. Scott's day was about to go horrifically wrong. About uh, 11.30 in the morning, started coiling up the tagline, you know, to get ready to move it. My partner jumped on the tractor. 
Well, you started moving and the front wheel caught the tail of the tagline. The wheel acted like a winch. It just cinched the rope up and everything went just And uh, all my fingers were gone. What was there was tattered flesh and meat and bone. Scott lost four fingers on his right hand. Co-workers packed the severed fingers in ice while Scott was rushed to San Francisco's Bunka Clinic. I got an emergency phone call that a gentleman had lost all four fingers. He says, you know, your injuries are pretty severe because the fingers were ripped off. They weren't cut. And even if they were smashed, they'd be in better shape. The fingers had been ripped from the joints. Dr. Lee and his team tried to salvage what they could from Scott's shredded hand. We actually did replant two of the fingers. One finger basically did, did not make it. Three days later, uh, I had to go back into surgery. They amputated the middle finger. It, it died. Worse was to come. Day two after his operation, Scott's remaining finger developed a clot. To save it, Charles Lee turned to medieval medicine. Really kind of funny, I'd, I'd be sitting there, my arms propped up in a splint and bandaged up, and this slimy critter on the end of my finger. And I'd look away for 10 minutes and look back, now he's twice as big as he was, and like 40 minutes later, he's huge. Leeches have a built-in ability to stop blood from clotting. Doctors placed one of these bloodsuckers on the join where Scott's finger was reattached. The anticoagulant in the leech's saliva assisted blood flow. Scott's one working finger was saved. Of Scott's four severed fingers, just the index finger survived. His pinky remained a stump. Two vital middle fingers were absent. Without those two fingers, no way would Scott get back to the construction business. One finger and one thumb, uh, you can't climb much with that or pick much up with that, you know, or manipulate a pair of pliers or, or whatever. From medieval medicine, Dr. Lee turned to what sounded to Scott like something out of the future. I said to him, well, Scott, we can actually take your toes and place them on your hand. I remember clearly what I said, you can do that? <laughs> yeah. Scott had no idea what was in store. Amputation. It's about the last thing a patient wants to hear from a doctor. But in September 1997, an Englishman actually requested that his perfectly healthy leg be amputated. He was suffering from a psychological disorder called apotomnophilia. Patients are convinced that the only way they can be normal is to lose a limb. After being turned away by two doctors, the man eventually found a Scottish doctor willing to perform the unnecessary amputation. His healthy leg was cut off above the knee. What's more, two years later, a German with the same psychological affliction also had his leg cut off by the same doctor. Scott Thornton hit rock bottom when four fingers were ripped off his right hand on a building site. Doctors from the Bunker Clinic in San Francisco reattached one finger using leeches to assist the blood flow. But one functioning finger would not get Scott back to work. He thought his livelihood was over until Dr. Lee came up with a radical suggestion. I said to him, well, Scott, we can actually take your toes and place them on your hand. Dr. Lee was proposing a trade-off of body parts. Two of Scott's toes would be amputated and attached to his hand. He would disfigure his foot in exchange for a useful hand, if the operation worked. It was a gamble Scott had to take. There was a little bit of fear coming up to the, the operation, you know, uh, indecisiveness of am I going to do the right thing or not? How's it going to affect my feet? The surgery would be long and painstaking. 
First, Dr. Lee prepared Scott's finger stumps to receive their new extensions. I think we'll be able to get him a very good, good match with the toes. Just like in an organ transplant where you're harvesting a kidney or a liver or a heart, we're basically harvesting a toe. We can come all the way down to here with this. Two teams began removing the toes that would become Scott's new fingers. Okay. We'll cut these here and here, here and here. All the vital connections were teased out. Okay, we're prepared to let down the tourniquet now. Okay. Eventually, the toes were harvested. Okay, green toe. The next challenge was to graft them onto his hand by microsurgery. Charles Lee and his reattachment team linked blood vessel to blood vessel, nerve to nerve. It's being able to see another world, a world that you can't see with the naked eye. But if you can coordinate your hands and your movements to see into this world, uh, it's, re it's really quite amazing. After a marathon 12 hours on the operating table, Scott's toes have become fingers. If the gamble pays off, in a few months, this finger will regain its function. Scott has now spent a year of painful therapy, building strength and dexterity. You'd be surprised, I, uh, I, can, I can write very well with my right hand. It's, it's, uh, I don't have the endurance. My hand gets tired and sore quickly. He's teaching his new digits how to work like fingers. Basically, it's just stretches. At first, it was just uh, blocking. If you can grade him from a scale to 1 to 100, he'll probably reach, at best, somewhere between 80 to 85. He'll never reach 100, but obviously, from where he started, uh, that's a significant advance. And Scott hardly notices his two missing toes. Painful at first, walking with just eight toes is now no problem. They told me I would be in a wheelchair for a month, but uh, two and a half weeks, that was it. I had enough. Incredibly, thanks to Charles Lee's handiwork, Scott is going back to the construction business, but he's exchanging his pliers for a draftsman's pencil. I'm starting work Monday. I'm gonna go into the engineering department and uh, become a detailer trainee. So I've been very fortunate. From tattered flesh and bone to four functioning fingers, Scott Thornton's return to the workforce is a miracle of medieval medicine and modern microsurgery. I go see Dr. Lee and he tells me, Scott, you're the man. You're doing all this work. You're doing all this work. Well, if it weren't for Dr. Lee, I'd have nothing to work with. Horrible injuries, sores that won't heal. For all the miracles of modern medicine, Sometimes nature does best. Well, hello, Donna. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, doctor, but I'm looking forward to this. These are live maggots, and the good doctor is about to put them into an open wound. We know that the maggots will engulf infection. They'll eat it up. They fight infection, and they stimulate the wound to heal. Donna Nordquist injured her ankle six weeks ago but the deep gash has not healed. Where we need your foot. Okay, super, now we're ready to begin. So Dr. Handler is putting the fly larvae to work. Um, these maggots are specially chosen. They have a very strong appetite for uh, decaying tissue. Maggots only eat dead flesh. They leave living tissue alone. Hard to stomach, but remarkably effective. What modern medicine can take um, months to accomplish can often be treated in a couple of weeks with uh, maggot therapy. Okay. Okay. Donna, you did great. We're all done, and we'll see you in a couple of days. In a couple of weeks, Donna can expect to be back on her feet. 
thanks to these creepy crawly little doctors of dead flesh. Thank you, doctor. From the files of the truly medical incredible, alien hand syndrome. First uh, experience with it totally shocked me. When your right hand doesn't know what your left hand's doing. Really? I grabbed the door with my right hand. I swung it closed. Before it got all the way closed, my left hand just went up, stopped the door, pushed it back open. Jim Cook's hand developed a mind of its own after emergency brain surgery years ago. The alien hand results from two parts of the brain working simultaneously to perform contradictory functions. At one time, it was thought to be the work of a possessive spirit. It has even been known to be self-destructive. Saddest of all is there is no known cure for alien hand syndrome. It may sound like every woman's fantasy and every man's nightmare. A pregnant dad. Science fiction? Think again. Theoretically, there's no reason why uh, a, a pregnancy can't develop in the abdominal cavity of a man. A medical miracle in London has wheeled men closer to the delivery room because sometimes Mother Nature breaks her own rules. And this four-year-old miracle kid is living proof. Come on, troops, let's go. Let's go. Come on in. Delighted with their family life. Wow. And with four kids growing fast, Jane and Mark Ingram decide there's room for just one more. And then I was pregnant, so it happened very quickly. Mm. And so started the ride of the Ingrams' lives. At first, Jane wasn't even sure how many babies she was carrying. At 10 weeks, Jane went for an ultrasound. They looked like two little spiders, because it was so early in the pregnancy. They looked like little spiders bounce, bouncing around on the, on the screen. So that's when I knew, you know, it was twins. But nothing could prepare the Ingrams for nature's next surprise. I don't think to the day I die, really, I'd get over the shock of it. Incredibly, Jane is told a third baby is lying much lower in her abdomen, making it harder to detect. Are you sure? Jane was stunned. You just start preparing your mind for having twins, and then you're told you're having another one. And when you've got four children already, that is a shock. And it wasn't an easy pregnancy. The months passed, but Jane was worried that her body wasn't coping with her triplets. There's a normal amount. Of At seven months, Jane went to King's College Hospital in London for yet another ultrasound. Here is a little baby. Consultant obstetrician Dr. Jerkovic was amazed by what he saw. Two girls were developing normally, but the third triplet, a boy, was actually growing outside Jane's womb. Jane clearly released three eggs from her ovaries, and, um, and all three were fertilized, and uh, they traveled towards the uterus. Two eggs safely reached the uterus and implanted there, but the third one, implanted in the fallopian tube. The third baby's placenta aggressively attaches itself to other body organs. Its only job is to keep the baby alive, even if the mother's life is endangered. The placenta behaves a bit like a tumor, a bit like cancerous tissue, and it eats away. And the main worry is if the placenta is in in a in a inappropriate place, it will eat away uh, into important blood vessels and, and therefore create problems and fatal results. Ectopic pregnancies are a one in a hundred occurrence, but few ectopic babies survive. The mother usually miscarries, or surgeons remove the fetus because of the enormous risk to the mother's life. Jane could hemorrhage at any time. Instinct tells Dr. Jerkovic 
to operate immediately. But just 28 weeks old, the triplets and Jane may not survive the ordeal. Nobody's done this operation before. I said, I just hope to God they do it right. Premature babies born at 30 weeks have a 90% chance at survival. But at 28 weeks, the baby has only a 20% chance of living. Dr. Jerkovic was going to attempt to deliver three babies at 28 weeks. With four lives now at stake, Jane's doctor called in a dream team of expert consultants. There was a big team of, of people. It took us about a week to prepare. Three surgeons, three anesthesiologists, three pediatricians, three pediatric nurses, three midwives, and 11 surgical staff. So I've got no control over this, none. I said, the babies have got to come out, and I said, we could all die. For speed and access, the team opens up Jane's entire abdomen. And then you could see the uterus, which was on the left side, uh, and two babies were hidden inside, and the third baby was very deep in the pelvis. We couldn't actually see the third baby at the beginning of the operation. The Ingrams got their first lucky break. Two tiny girls, each weighing two pounds, were rescued from the womb without incident. They brought the children past as they lifted them out. Tiny little things. They came past in like little incubators and said, right, this is number one, this is number two. They're tiny little things, you know. Inside the operating theater, Dr. Jerkovic and his team began retrieving the third baby. Incredibly, the second placenta was attached to Jane's bladder and womb. If it detached now, she would hemorrhage violently. Delicately, they delved past Jane's abdominal organs. Miraculously, the little boy who grew among his mother's viscera was gently freed. And the placenta stayed attached. All three babies and Jane survived. It was perfect. It was the best I could possibly hope for. This is the little boy today, Ronan Ingram, and his sisters, Olivia and Mary. Born 10 weeks premature, they're fit and healthy four-year-olds. Even Ronan, who fought for life without a womb. He was so determined to be here. You know, you see that now in his yeah. character and nature, because he's mm. a little monkey, really. Well, everything was meant to be, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Ronan's birth, following a rare ectopic pregnancy carried to term, proves that a baby can grow outside the womb. And if a fetus doesn't need a womb, does it need a woman? From an ethical point of view, there's absolutely no reason why a man shouldn't consider being the pregnancy parent, so to speak, the birth parent. That Ronan Ingram survived as an ectopic baby is extraordinary. But without wombs, every male pregnancy would be ectopic. For now, a male pregnancy would be life-threatening for dad and baby. It's a little bit difficult to encourage uh, men to take this further at the moment because we don't know how to do it with safety. I've received two letters from men in other countries who asked whether or not uh, I would consider uh, the possibility of uh, placing an embryo uh, in, into their body. Uh, both men had undergone gender reassignment surgery. Men wishing to take one more step across the gender divide may one day carry babies to term. <laughs> but the Ingram triplet survival suggests successful ectopic births will remain in the realm of the medical incredible.